I'm a photographer first and foremost. This is what I've been doing for 26 years now. And what I really love about working for On One Software is that we create software for people like me. And I tend to be sort of on one extreme side of it. Uh, but what I like about it is that I've been working with Photoshop for nearly 20 years. And I know just enough Photoshop to be dangerous. I pride myself on the fact that I'm a hack. You know, how many of you are Photoshop experts? Somebody's going to throw a hand up, yeah, right? I mean, we're all kind of in our own way, but you know, I know enough to be dangerous. And, and we as a company, what we're known for is uh, being a plug-in for Photoshop. When we started eight years ago, you needed Photoshop in order to use our product. Now we're a fully standalone application. So not only are we a plug-in still for Photoshop, but we're a standalone application. We're also a plug-in for Lightroom and Aperture. How many of you are using Lightroom, Aperture? Good, uh, nice divide. Photoshop? A lot of people using Photoshop, right? And how much of Photoshop are you using really at the end of the day? You know, it's like we, 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 you know, that, and, and that's the reality is that, you know, Photoshop's awesome for what it does, but it's such a behemoth of a program. And so what we do, what we've set out to do, uh, is simplify a lot of those advanced techniques. So you don't need to be a Photoshop guru uh, to get professional looking results. So uh, our perfect photo suite seven, collection of seven different products then uh, that we'll be going through this afternoon. Uh, I ask that you probably hold questions till the end. I'll come back and do that. They're filming this. So to make an easier flow for their recording, why don't we come back, ask questions at the end. Uh, but we'll be going through the suite. Uh, previous owners of, who's owned suite seven? Previous versions of our product, okay. So uh, Suite 7 by far is the best release we've had to date. And I've been around for four of them now. And I have to say, this is, is just jaw-dropping what we've accomplished. Our dev team, Dan Harlicker, our senior product developer, uh, and all the engineers uh, have come up with. We've got brand new product called Perfect Black and White. We've got new product uh, updates to Perfect Effects, whole new redesigned user interface. Uh, so this afternoon, uh, we'll be going through and taking a look at some of that product. Black and white, um, when we created this product, uh, I was definitely, well, there's some other stuff that's out there that's really good. We better raise the bar, and I have to say, this is awesome. I spent my time in the darkroom. I had a custom darkroom business, uh, and what I can now achieve in three minutes is something that would take me two weeks to try and do in a traditional darkroom. Super cool stuff. Uh, that's perfect black and white. We've got perfect effects. Uh, this is all photographic effects. For over 400 effects are included in this product. Uh, and these are based on sort of advanced Photoshop techniques uh, to get a stylized look. And the goal is to get you to start combining these effects in a way that's unique to you, come up with a style that you like, and then save a preset. And now those four, five, six steps that you took originally now become a one-click edit. Uh, we've got Perfect Portrait, portrait retouching software where we've developed auto face detection technology that automatically smooths the skin, brightens the eyes, and whitens the teeth. Uh, we'll show you how easy it is to uh, retouch a portrait. Uh, we've got an update to Perfect Mask here. Uh, this is by far the toughest thing to do in Photoshop. Uh, if you're a Lightroom or Aperture user, you know that's one thing you can't do in either of those products. We give you some great tools uh, simplifying that. Uh, focal point, uh, this is one that, it's been my favorite up until we released black and white. I really love focal point because regardless of what camera I may have used, I can go back and replicate the look of some of those high-end uh, fast lenses. The 1.4, the 1.2 lenses, we can go in and create the look with focal point. Perfect layers, this is what you can't do in Lightroom and Aperture and combined photos together. Uh, we've simplified that now, uh, you know, and I used to use Photoshop to do all this. Uh, people say, hey, I've got Photoshop. I don't need layers. Well, I'll show you how easy it is to do combine images and some of the different things that I really like about it, extending uh, the imaging editing power of both layers and aperture. And then this is the one we're known for. It's the next version of Genuine Fractals, now called Perfect Resize, uh, all about one-click presets now. So we've got all presets that have been optimized for a variety of different media types. So your resin coated papers, your matte papers, your canvas, one-click edits now, and then great tools for simplifying things that you might be doing in Photoshop when it comes to printing. So uh, let's jump right in, take a look at the suite here. 
Uh, I'm going to be showing the a majority of the product probably out of Lightroom today, uh, but I will touch on how we get to it. And let's open up with Photoshop and just show you how we get to our product. So if you're a Photoshop user, we are a plugin for Photoshop. Still, we haven't abandoned Photoshop. And this tab right here, that's one way you can get to the plugins. The plugins themselves are installed under the File Automate menu here. So this is where you get to the plugins within Photoshop. They're grayed out right now because I don't have an image open. And if I come over here to the Window menu, go to Extensions, come here to On One, that's going to open up that floating palette. I can have this stacked anywhere on my screen. I prefer to have it sort of nested out of the way. So it's uh, in my, with my adjustments, easy to get to. And then I can see my layers uh, as well as I'm working. So uh, that's Photoshop. We'll come back to Photoshop here. Let's start with layers, because layers is really the, the home, the hub of our suite. And uh, as a Lightroom user, that's the one thing, or an Aperture user, you can't do is combine photos together. Uh, I'm going to start with an exposure. You know, here, beautiful day. How often do we uh, shoot an image? Uh, I've selected two images in Lightroom. We're opening into layers here, where we expose, expose for the foreground and expose for the sky. Um, and you know, you get your blown out sky and you get your very dark foreground. So here I've just opened those two images and this is a unique tool to us and it's the uh, magic bug. So down the left side here, these are our different tools and that are available when you're in perfect layers. And that's indicated up here uh, in the top left here. So you can see I'm uh, highlighted in that and I could go to any other plugin then from here. So layers is really the home. Uh, on how I get to all of our other products. I have uh, the browser, so if I'm using the standalone, we actually function as a standalone application as well. Uh, I can browse to different folders here, uh, like a directory, like Bridge, if you will, a very light version of that. Um, but I can get to images that way. We also have extras. Uh, I'll come back to the extras here uh, with another plugin. But here we've got those two images then that opened as layers. And what I'm going to do here is use my masking bug, this antenna looking thing, to quickly combine exposures here. So I click on that bug, and just like this, rotate that around, and I can position this up, and control mask opacity with the left, and layer opacity with the right. So you see how seamlessly I can just blend exposures there, just like that, and I can refine that so if I want a little more, and again, I can bring that up with that right antenna. So very quickly, I've just combined two, two images together. Uh, you know, I, it's the, really the foundation of HDR photography. You know, HDR is about taking multiple images, uh, stacking them up, doing different ex exposure blending. I don't go to those great lengths. Uh, I've got a friend, he shoots 10, 15 images. You know, that's his style. I don't have the patience for that. But I do have the patience to blend two images together, and that's what I'll do. Uh, but this is a real quick and easy way to quickly combine uh, photos here. And if I save it, if I hit the close button, it's going to return me right back to Lightroom. Uh, and there is the new image right there. And if I was to open this in Photoshop, I'll come back and show another image there. So uh, I actually maintain those layers. So we're not flattening this file by any means. So you actually can go back and continue to edit. Let's show you another example here with a head swap. So here, File menu, come down to the plugin extras. We'll jump into layers here. And here, I've opened up two images then uh, that we shot in the studio. Dan Harlicker shot this. Uh, so this is his wife and her friend. So we've got our two images here. And again, uh, just grab one of my tools. This time, I'm going to use the masking brush here. So I'm going to grab this brush right here, increase the size, and I want to make sure that I'm on the top layer here. So you can see how you click on the different layers. We just want to be on the top layer. Let's bring up my brush size just a bit. And you notice in the center of the brush that that's a minus. If I tap the X key, that becomes the plus. So it, and we toggle between paint in and paint out. So great keyboard shortcut is to learn that X key so you don't always have to come up here and click on paint in, paint out. With my right hand, just tap the X key. So here we are in paint out. We're going to do a quick head swap. I'm just going to paint right over her just like this. How quick did I just combine two photos? 
mean, some of you blink. This, when I show this, people blink and they go, uh, well, what just happened? You know, that, that's how quick I can do this. Right there, you see, there's the layer mask that was created. So we're automatically creating a layer mask. So those of you familiar with Photoshop, you know in Photoshop you actually have to click on a little button and say, hey, create the layer mask, and then you have to be on the layer mask. In our product, you're always working on the layer mask. So uh, again, I save this. Let's close this. I'll save this. Come right back to Lightroom. And then let me open this in Photoshop here. We'll edit in Photoshop. So I'm going to open this image in Photoshop, and you'll see that we haven't flattened this file. This is a new PSD. There's the layer mask. You can see I didn't do a complete stroke there. Uh, but if I wanted, I can come back and re-edit this in Photoshop. So the beauty, what I find the beauty of our product is regardless of where I'm working, is that I always have our tools at your fingertips. Sometimes I find myself in Lightroom. Sometimes I find myself in Photoshop. Occasionally I'll find myself in Aperture. Maybe I just want to go into the standalone. So that's the power, you know, we've got all these great tools then that really simplify. Let's go show you one more example here with perfect layers. And this is four images. Come up here to the file menu, come down to plugin extras, go to perfect layers. And we're now going to open up four images here. So we've got one, two, three, those four images. This is Mount Hood. Somebody was speaking about Mount Hood a little earlier. Uh, yeah, right? Uh, Bluebird Day up at Mount Hood. Um, snowboarder, uh, Dan Harlicker shot this. I was up there with him. And I'm quickly going to combine and make an action sequence out of those four photos. So uh, same premise here. I'm going to use the masking brush. And I just want to make sure I'm on that top layer there. And I'm going to come right down here, erase him. You see the little black dot that was created? That's where the snowboarder was. The key here now is that I want to flip the mask. I want to invert the mask. So I click this invert button, and it brings the snowboarder back. You can see right there. So we're just flipping the mask around, inverting the mask. And that's what I'm going to do for each layer here. I'm going to go down, erase him off that layer, invert mask. Go down a layer here. Erase him, invert mask. Now, how quick did we just combine four photos? I know how to do this in Photoshop. I know some of you know how to do this in Photoshop, but can you do it that fast? You know, and that's, that's the whole reason, again, why we exist as a company is to simplify your life so you're not spending all day retouching, doing creative effects to your images. So final touch for me would be that crop so I grab my crop tool, give it a panoramic crop there, just like that. You know, it comes up when I show perfect layers that, oh, you guys were using a tripod. You know, what happens when things don't line up so neatly? And it's a great and valid question. Uh, so here, if I needed real precise registration between images, if things didn't line up, what I do is I get on the layer that I want to align with the layer below. So this example here, I'm going down to that second layer here, and I'm going to invert Let's go back to the brush here. I'm going to go, I'm going to invert the mask back because I'm going to zoom in here. So let's say I needed that mountain to be real aligned. What I do is I get on the layer then and I'd lower the opacity. And you can see how the mountain just kind of shifts right there. So if I really needed precise registration, I'd lower the uh, opacity of that top layer to align with the layer below. Tab the V key is in Victor. That puts me in the transform tool, this top tool here. And now I can come in here, and if I really needed precise placement, just come in and adjust that. And if I tap the arrow keys, I can easily come in here and refine that. So a very uh, precise way to align. So that's what you do if you really need to line up images between layers very quickly. Uh, go back to the brush, we'll click apply here, invert that mask, Let's come back, turn these on. There we are. And again, I click close here. It's going to save. It's going to save me uh, back into Lightroom. And here I'm going to open this one back into Photoshop, because this is what I really like to point out. Because these, uh, this is a mistake that I continually make, uh, no matter how much I've been using Photoshop. But you look here, we open that image. All those layers, all those layer masks are maintained. Um, but you notice here, in Photoshop, in Photoshop you have the uh, option, the distinction, to be either on 
the image thumbnail or the layer mask thumbnail. Well, when I open this image up, look where we're at. We've defaulted to the image thumbnail. Well, I can't tell you how many times I've been compositing where I've got 10 or 15 layers going and I'm jumping through layers and layer masks and inevitably I end up on the image thumbnail. Well, if I was to start painting right now, I'd be destructively editing my image layer. She's nodding, she knows this. We all, we've made this mistake, right? In perfect layer, so, so I need to make sure I click on that image uh, layer mask before I do any brushing. Well, when you're working with a ton of layers and you're, not, you're, you're trying to get a quick edit done, you make those mistakes. When you're working with perfect layers, you don't have to worry about being on the layer mask because you're always working on the layer mask. So that's one of the things that I, I love about perfect layers is that A, I couldn't do that. I couldn't combine those four photos as quick as I did in layers. B, I'm always working on the layer mask when I'm working in perfect layers. And I'm also extending, you know, if I'm just a Lightroom user, an Aperture user, that's the one thing you can't do. As great as those programs are, you can't combine photos in either of those products. So we really extend uh, the editing power of both of those applications. Not a lot of you go out and spend $900 or $800 or $1,000, whatever Photoshop costs these days. You know, this is a great alternative for quickly combining photos. So that's perfect layers. And that's just one of the seven plugins. Let's jump back into Lightroom here. Uh, and probably the most comprehensive plugin that we do, uh, just as an individual plugin, is going to be Perfect Effects. And I'm going to start with Perfect Effects, and uh, I'm going to start with a preset. We're going to show you how easy it is to apply a stylized look, and then we'll come back and we'll start showing you, walking you through the steps, how you go about creating a preset. So here, I've got my image right click so you can get to five of the plugins from the right click within Lightroom. Uh, you can't get to perfect layers, you can't get to perfect mask from the right click uh, because of file management, the way uh, Lightroom works with files. So those two, you do need to come down to plugin extras, but you can get to all the plugins from the file uh, plugin extras menu or new and improved with version uh, 7 of Suite 7 you now can jump directly into a plugin. So now I want to just go into Perfect Effects here. So I select that. I'm going to edit a copy here. That's going to tend to be my workflow. Uh, typically when I'm working with images out of Lightroom, uh, I'm going to edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments. I'm making my tonal adjustments, my white balancing, those types of things. So I want those to carry forward into my creative edit. Uh, I typically am not working with the original, and specifically if I'm working with a raw image, we're always going to be creating uh, a Lightroom um, adjustment copy. So here I click edit. It's going to open up this image. And uh, we are in perfect effects now. And I've opened into my presets category here. This is an image of my sister and her daughter. Uh, one morning they were walking out to go shopping and I was like, oh my gosh, you guys look so dang cute and fashionistas. Let's just take a quick pic. I only had my iPhone. Snapped a quick pic with my iPhone. This isn't anything fancy. Uh, but it means a lot to me. It was a cute picture of my family. That, that's what I like. But I thought, geez, I wonder if I can go into perfect effects and do something really cool. Well, I think I did, my style anyways. I've created a preset, so we've got these presets then. We're going to come back and show you how to do this. So these are stylized looks that I've created for myself. This is my style, single click, sort of a cross-process texture overlay with an acid burn edge. Uh, this one called Cross Grunge, uh, heavier cross-process look with a film edge, sort of a medium format film edge. These are my styles. This might not be your style, but there's over 400 different effects that are included. And so we want to get you to start combining these effects in a way that become unique to you where you get to this one click edit. So what I'm showing you right now is a combination of effects. So this is the one that I really like, that I use a lot. I'm still a film shooter. Uh, I shoot a lot of film uh, in this day and age. I created a film look from my iPhone image that gave me, it made it look like, you know, that mistake I make. Oh, uh, there's film in that camera. I closed the door real quickly, right? Some of us remember the film days here. And so if I click this expand button here, that's going to show me then all the effects that were used in the creation of this preset. So I use one, two, three, four, five, six, five, six different effects here then. We'll come back and show you how we go about creating this. But now maybe I didn't want, maybe my mom likes the photo, but she's like, what's that stuff along the bottom? She doesn't know film. She's like, that just ruined the picture. Well, I can come in here. I can remove 
So if I didn't want the light leak on here but wanted to create that cross process look still, I could come in here, turn those back on. So now I've totally lost the light leak there. Click apply and it's going to return me right back to Lightroom stacked back with my original now. I've got my quick creative edit. So uh, that's the goal of what Perfect Effects is, to, is to get you to that sort of preset stage where you can quickly and easily apply your signature look to an image. So there's the creative edit, there's the original, you know. I love wacky, crazy colors. I used to run my negative or E6 slide film through C41 chemistry and it would give sort of those high saturated contrast colors and now, you know, with a single click I can achieve that from whatever, what any other camera, you know, maybe it wasn't the iPhone that I used. Uh, but that's perfect effect. So now let's uh, walk you through sort of how we go about creating uh, an effect here. Uh, let, uh, let's see here, let's go with this one. So I right click on that, choose edit in, go right into perfect effects here. Gonna edit that copy. So again, non-destructive workflow, it's creating that new version back in Lightroom. So this was uh, shot by uh, one of our uh, employees at the office, Liz LePage. Um, and you know, it's a nice lifestyle photo, but it's you know, kind of flat. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through the steps, uh, start adding effects. So this is the framework. This is uh, how most of our plugins are gonna look when you're in them. On the left side, you're gonna have different categories. So here's the effects, then you're gonna have your favorites category, then you're gonna have your presets. And so when we opened up originally, I was in my presets. So down along the left side, these are all the categories that we've created. So if you're coming from a previous version uh, of perfect effects, you wouldn't recognize this. We redesigned the whole interface to make it sort of much more Lightroom-esque in its look and feel, which to me was a significant improvement. Uh, when I open up a category, I'll get a thumbnail preview of those effects. So here I can resize that window. So if I want a larger thumbnail preview, I just grab the center handle there. Uh, I can also go, so if I wanted this a little larger, I can go to a double column or triple column view or complete list view, depending on what your preference is. So a lot more uh, view options than previous version. If I want to make the panels disappear, tap the command arrow keys to hide all that. If I want to see just my effect, uh, which I haven't added yet. So. Uh, also, new to Perfect Effects 4 from previous versions was you couldn't search for effects, which to me was a, a significant problem uh, that we've addressed. And you know, I don't use 400 different effects day in, day out. I use 10, 15, you know? So I remember a name, tonal contrast. That's one I've, I, I like right here, this little flag. That's been flagged as a favorite, so that's unchecked. When I click on that, now I can jump into my favorites category and not have to worry about what category that's in. So I can easily get to the stuff that I use all the time. Well, tonal contrast is one. Click on that. You can see we've just added a little extra life to that image with a little tonal contrast. Over here in the effect stack, this is where the effect gets loaded. So uh, this is sort of the, the building block steps, just like kind of in layers here. Uh, we're gonna add effects on top of each other. Depending on what the effect is then that I've added, I'm gonna have uh, this subset, this effect options tab. This might be closed when you first open it. Click on that and depending on what that effect is that's in the effect stack here, I'm gonna have the ability to come in here and adjust it. So maybe I wanna give it a little more local contrast and a little more clarity here. You can see we're just giving that photo some extra crispness. But Negative side effect that I'm seeing is up in the right hand side of the sky. Yeah, you're getting that kind of haloing effect. That's a side effect of clarity. You tend to push it up too much. Your images start to get a glow on them. Uh, so we've got some great editing tools uh, that allow me to refine this. So here, uh, I'm gonna use this masking bug where I use that masking bug in layers to blend exposures. Here I'm gonna use it to remove a large part of the effect across the horizon there. So I'll click on that effect and these little antennas control the width and allow me to rotate. And if I come down here to the black tab here, this allows me to go into a mask preview. So I can come in here, go to mask red. So now I can actually see what the mask is doing. And the right antenna, if I bring that all the way down, that controls feather. 
So you can see here I can get a nice feathered, but for here I've got a real strong horizon line. I probably don't need much feather on that, so I'll position that right about there and come back out of this and you can see. So now I've totally removed tonal contrast from being applied to the sky and that noisiness uh, that was being picked up by that. So great uh, selective editing tool. I like it. What I'm going to do here is click the add button. I'm now ready to add another effect to. So you can see the little tonal contrast layer there. It's got the little black bar across the top. Uh, now I've got my new empty layer for me to add another effect to. So in my favorites category, I've already flagged a favorite. It's this blue uh, photo filter. So just single click on that. It's going to add that. And I want to apply this effect selectively again. I don't want to cool down the, the surfboard, the foreground, the sand, but I do want to bring out a little deeper, richer blue uh, in the sky and the ocean. So again, I'm going to use that masking bug here. I grab that masking bug, click on that, and this time I'm going to set the masking bug down towards the foreground here. And in this one, I'm probably going to want to use a feather because there you can see the, the hard edge transition. Let's come back to the mask preview. So here I just raise that right antenna and you can see how we get that nice blending into the water there. So I'll position that up right about where the water starts to wash up on the shore there. Right about there. Come back out and now you can see I've totally removed the blue from the foreground. If I want, I can adjust then. You look under the effect options tab here. So those the uh, settings have changed from what tonal contrast was. Well, here I can get a little deeper, richer blue, or I can change the actual color of the blue. So if I want a darker blue, lighter blue, I can come in into the color wheel here, find that blue that I like. I can adjust the strength of it. So if I want a little stronger blue here, just like that, and maybe I want to increase base saturation, get a nice distinction between the sky, the ocean, all without being applied to the foreground. So you can see the little layer mask then that's being applied here. What I can do is I can copy this mask. So here I'm going to come into the mask tab. I'm going to go to copy mask. So rather than me having to jump back and forth between the masking bug and always using the masking bug, once I've created uh, an effect or, or removed it, uh, in a way that I want to remove those effects from further effects, what I'll do is come in here, copy that mask. So here I'm going to copy that, come over here to the Add button, and I'm going to add an another effect now. And again, I have one that I've flagged as a favorite. It's the orange. Click on the orange. And what I'm going to do here is uh, warm up the foreground. But you can see by adding the orange, we've negated that blue. So here's where I'm going to use that mask. I'm going to come in here up to the mask tab, go paste mask. Well, it's removed it from the foreground. So get in the habit of inverting. Just think of how you can use a mask, you know, apply it for one, but then flip it for another. So here I come up to the mask tab, go invert mask. And now we've totally removed the effect from the sky and the ocean and are limiting it to the foreground. So here I'm going to push up the strength slider, get a little more richer, warmer sand going there. Maybe a little saturation. Let's go pretty heavy here, just for example. But you can see how we've really warmed up the foreground very quickly. Well, what if I don't want the orange on the surfboard? You know, I can't really use the masking bug to go in and remove that. So we've got this masking brush. You're going to find this in uh, our plugins. Great, powerful tool here. And let's actually come into the mask preview so you can see what's happening. So uh, bracket keys control brush size, the left and right bracket keys. Uh, if I hold the shift key down and type the bracket keys, that controls the feather. It's great little keyboard shortcuts here. I want to go to paint out. You can see in the center of the brush there, that's the plus. Tap the X, that becomes the minus. And you can see, well, if I was to being using the normal brush, well, that's not a very good job here. I'd really need to be precise with my brush. Well, we've got a brand new tool included in Suite 7, and it's called the Perfect Brush. And up here in the menu bar here, you will see the Perfect Brush option. So I'm going to enable that. And this is a really powerful tool in that it's almost edge aware. It's not completely edge aware, but now I don't have to be super precise with my brush. If you look where the brush is, the brush is on 
halfway on uh, the surfboard on the sand. Now look as I paint that effect off the surfboard. Here I don't have to be super careful about where the brush is. As long as I keep the center of the brush on that surfboard where that minus is, it's going to limit where the effect gets removed from. So very quickly I was able to remove the orange effect from the surfboard, come back out of here. You can see now I've totally removed that effect. So we've gone from gray day at the beach to adding just a little bit of life to that image. You know, and I'm spending way more time talking about it than you would actually do when you do it, you know. Finishing touch for me, uh, one more effect. I'm going to add a border, you know, and that was always, uh, we used to file out the negative carriers in the darkroom. So here I'm going to go into our borders category, go into uh, the sloppy borders. And I love that old filed out negative carrier look there. Let's scroll down. So we've got all sorts of great, great borders then that we've included single click, add a film edge. I can adjust the size, so if I want it more, less, just like that, maybe go with something like that. Now what I can do is save this as a preset. So now I've gone through all these steps. Now what I can do is save this as a preset. So I come up here to the preset tab, go save preset, and I've got these different categories that I've included. Here I've actually saved it, so I won't save it again, but it was in the film category I created, so I could say, give it a name, Johnny D created it, give it a description, click, click create. And now, let's reset this image here. So there's the original, so once I've created the preset, now I can just go into my presets category here, which I saved in film, and I've got that one click effect, add that preset, and now that becomes all those steps. You see over here in the effects stack, it only lists the preset name. So that's all you're going to see when you add a preset. If you want to see uh, any of the underlying effects that were used there, what you're going to do is click the expand button here, and then that will show you those presets. Masking bug. When you, anytime you use the masking bug and save a preset, those get saved into the presets themselves. But the brushing that I did on the surfboard, that doesn't get saved into the preset. So if I wanted to remove that effect, I'd have to go back to the orange and paint that. We don't save uh, selective brushing in the preset. Your subjects change, you know, position. So those don't carry, carry over. So any uh, selective brushing that you do uh, those don't get carried in the preset. Here, I click apply. It's going to return me right back to Lightroom with that original image. Well, you would need to remember the, uh, I mean, the, the pre, when you open up the preset, it's going to show you all the effects that were used in the preset, but any kind of selective brushing, no, it doesn't keep track of like, hey, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, that there, there has uh, the one thing that sort of the recipe style where you can go back and uh, reuse a recipe uh, in the preset. Like we don't save that, you, so you need to save a preset. Uh, we have a recently used category. Let me open up another one here. Uh, let's see here. This is an image that I just shot of my nephew this weekend. And uh, his grandmother gave him a big wheel for his birthday, and there he is sporting his big wheel. So again, perfect, perfect effects here. Uh, I created a preset, and if, uh, so I called it Big D, so single click, I've gotten more of a vintage look here to, to the image. Um, and if I click that expand button, it'll show me then the effects that were used. But any of the brushing that I might have done, there's no like tracking of that. Um, if I went in, let's say I just added effects, I didn't save a preset, and you're like, oh gosh, you know, I didn't save a preset, I want to come back and use that same look on another image. We record about 10 of the last times that you've used it. So if you've gone a month, chances are you're not going to see that. Uh, but if you happen to go back a couple days later, if you've only used perfect effects a couple times, what you can do is come down here into the recently used category 
and you would then see uh, all the, diff uh, the different combinations of the last 10 effects or, or 10 um, times that you used it. So we do have a little recording going on, but it doesn't happen every time. So get, uh, what I try to encourage is to get in the habit of creating presets when you really find a style that you like. It's real quick to save it as a preset, and then you know you can delete it if you don't like it, but create different categories then, you know, favorite, and you can flag it as a favorite, those types of things. So here, uh, for this image, I like, you know, I like that style, but I want to bring a little more texture out on it. So there's a starting point for me for a preset. It was like, yeah, let's do a quick vintage. Well, what if I want to continue to add? So here I'll jump back into the effects category here. And uh, we've got basic brushes. So these are great effects that are meant to be painted in. So they're indicated by this little brush here. Uh, if you see a little brush in the left corner, those are meant to be painted in effect. So here, I'm going to scroll down here to the brush. What do we want here? HDR. I really want to bring out just some texture in the image of some things here. So I've already got an empty layer. I want to show you something here. So if I was on, let's actually delete this layer here. So there, so if, I, if I've added an effect, if I've single clicked on effect and I come over and I add another effect here, it's going to swap out the effect that was used. So it's something to be aware of. If you single click and then come back and single click on an effect, it's going to swap it out. Uh, it gets a little frustrating uh, when you don't remember that. Just Command Z uh, will undo that. And um, what you can then do is come back in here. Let's reset the mask there. So there, I want to click the Add button. So I always want to make sure I have the empty layer. If I double click on the effect, what it will do is add the effect and then um, create the new empty layer here. So by double clicking the effect, it adds the effect, then creates the new empty layer. It's one way to do it. I prefer because I tend to do some editing with that effect layer that I don't want to go up to the empty layer, then have to come back down, do my brushing. So I do the single click, then I come in, click the add button to add that new effect layer. So here's that empty layer. I'm going to add that brush HDR effect here. So again, this effect is meant to be painted in, indicated by that little brush here. So I'm going to increase my brush size a bit. Don't need a whole lot of feather there. So the shift bracket key. And uh, let's just start painting in here. So you can see now I, I can come in, add some gritty detail into the body. And what I'll do here, I want to bring out some texture in his clothes, but I don't want a whole lot on his face. But I do want to sort of accentuate the hair, the wheel. Just come through. You can see how I've just brought out some of that detail on the leg. I want to make the shoe. And then again, well, I'll, I'll kind of lower my brush, tap the X key. We'll just come right over that, paint. I don't want any on his face. <coughs> Keep the face nice and soft, but to really sort of accentuate some of the detail. So that's the, the HDR effect there. You can see the mask uh, that's created. And if I do want to paint some more detail in here, uh, again, just quickly adjust the brush size, tap the X key to toggle between painting in and painting out. You can also turn any uh, normal effect into a paint in effect by inverting it. So if you go into, once you've added an effect like Dirty Bird here, if I wanted that to be a paint in effect, I come up here to the mask and go invert mask, and you see how that becomes black, and now I can paint in that effect. So you have the ability to turn any of those effects in perfect effects into a paint in effect. So if I wanted Dirty Bird and I wanted to paint in that effect, I could come in here. If I only wanted it on him, keeps sort of the green in the background. I'd probably need to be precise or use my perfect brush here. Let's use that for paint out. Just remove that. Paint the effect in. But yeah, you can turn any uh, effect into a paint in uh, or paint out. So you can see those are the layer masks there. And again, if I wanted, I could copy paste those layer masks in no time. So you know, there, standard image, just adding a little texture with some paint in HDR effect, bring out some of the detail there. Click apply. It's going to return right back to Lightroom, stack back with my original. I want to show you one more example of perfect effects uh, out of Photoshop. 
because with Photoshop, when you use Photoshop, you have the ability to create smart objects. So that's one of the cool things that you can do utilizing our tools is that you have the ability to go in and here what we're doing is we're condensing all those effects, creating a new layer. So you, if I were to open this image back in Photoshop, you're going to see perfect effects layer, you're going to see background layer. You're not going to see all these effects then that were used in the creation of that. So we sort of sandwich those effects, it becomes its own layer, but it doesn't allow me to go in and then re-edit any of those effects once it's been applied. Where if I'm using it in Photoshop, if I open an image in Photoshop, I can go in and re-edit those images. So here, let's grab that image, let's jump into Photoshop, I'm gonna edit the original. Uh, I just shot this this last weekend, was with my mom, you know, we're going home and I was, just saw this big great tree, this was in the East Bay, and I was like, oh my gosh, the sun setting through that, I just, it strikes me. But the image itself doesn't quite hold up to what I kind of saw at that time, you know, how often do we press the, the shutter and we get those images back and they're just not quite what we envisioned. You know, with perfect effects, that's what you can do. You can just quickly create presets and apply your vision here. So the first thing I'm going to do here is uh, right click on the image and we're going to turn this into a smart object. So here I'm going to create smart object. And I already created a preset for this. So with the panel, rather than coming up to the file menu, going and launching the plugin, if I have a preset already created, when I'm using it in Photoshop here, I can come over, saved it in the film category here, and I think I called it Sunset Glow. So I have access to my presets from the panel here. So now I'll just double click on that preset It'll open perfect effects. It'll apply those preset, that preset that I've created, give me a stylized look to this image, return me right back into Photoshop in no time. How cool is that? And that's, that's the goal of our product is to, to get you to you know, that preset creation again where it applies that stylized look. Why not do it in a layer instead of doing it as yeah. so the, the, a layer? So here, what well, you, you could do that as well. You could do opacity, but here, by doing a smart object, so if I had not created a smart object here, it would come back as a brand new layer. It would say perfect effects. If I wanted to edit any of the uh, effects that were used in that, I'd have to actually delete the layer, start over, or as you say, adjust opacity, but that's not really going to allow me to edit uh, a part of the effects that may have been used. By creating a smart object here, what I can do is I can double click on this, open perfect effects back up, see the effects that were used, and if I didn't like an effect, delete it. I don't have to completely start over. So that's, that's the advantage where, so if I had, didn't create a smart object, what we would do is flatten all those images where now, being I used a smart object, it's it remembers all those effects, allows me to come back, refine that then to my liking. So maybe I didn't want summer. I could come and delete that or lighten edges. You know, I can remove one of those effects or maybe, I, maybe you know, again, I'm the, a guy who really loves film edges. That's my style. Come in here to the film edges, grab a, a six, four, five thin, just like that, click apply. You know, so that's the, the beauty of using a smart object for you Photoshop users is that it a, allows you to come back, refine those effects very quickly, very easily, if you find yourself doing that a lot. I don't, I tend to be able to like, okay, I like that look, I'm done with it. You know, I'm all about getting in and out. I'm not spending hours and hours of time um, doing it. Some of you will, I, I'll have an image here, I'll show you towards the end. Uh, that would have taken me, it took me about the, the whole length of this, uh, but I'll show you just a quick thing of what I did. But that's how easy it is to sort of get in and out here. Click save. Return right back to Lightroom being we opened out of Lightroom, but that is perfect effects. And that probably by far is our most comprehensive single plugin that really allows you, includes a little bit of everything. There's some black and white effects in there. Um, there's tonal contrast, there's edges, uh, all sorts of great stuff. 
so that's just one of the plugins then, and there it is. I edited the original, so it's right back there in Lightroom. Let's jump into perfect black and white. So let's start with this image. Right click, perfect, actually let's go with landscape here. Perfect black and white. I can right click now, jump right into it here. I'm going to choose to edit the copy. So this is uh, from the land out west that I'm sure we're all familiar if you've been out to California, right? Exactly. And if you're a, a black and white photographer, uh, you know who made this fa uh, valley famous. Um, so here, that's our, our basic postcard image here. Right? And we're going to give him a run for his money today. Uh, you know, basic postcard image. You know, I've been, I grew up in California. I've been to Yosemite many a time. This is the mouth of the valley. That's the basic black and white conversion. There's nothing fancy there. You can do that in Photoshop. You can do that in Lightroom. We're going to come in and show you how easy it is to now really take this to the next level. So uh, again, the, the user interface uh, looks really similar here. Uh, hold on one sec here. I noticed my power is not plugged in. Oops, yep, yeah, running out of battery life. Glad I caught that. Um, so here, uh, in the effects category, uh, we've got all these great effects. 20th century classic silver. We actually have uh, an effect named after the master himself. Single click, let's just add that. And you notice, one click, how much more we've added to that photo. Now we've get, we're going to come back and use some of the editing tools then that we have in Perfect Black and White. So I'm going to start with my brightness brush. It's this top tool up here. And I'm going to bring down the amount just a bit here. Set that to about 13. But the right side of the valley is a little brighter than uh, the left side of the valley. So if I tap the X key, I toggle between lighten and darken again. So I want to darken. And I'm going to darken up the right side of the valley here. So here I'm just going to paint right over and being I'm, I've enabled the perfect brush here. So as I paint over the valley here, you notice where my brush is. I'm not darkening the clouds back there, the area that I don't want. That's the beauty of that perfect brush. It keeps, it limits where the effect gets applied. Next I'm going to go to our detail brush, third brush down here. And I'm going to darken, or not darken, I'm going to bring out uh, some of the cracks, the crevices of El Capitan's face. I really want to accentuate that weatherborn look there. On your brushes, is there a way you hover over it? Does it tell you that the feature that it's enabling? Uh, yeah, it does give you a little description. Yeah. So yeah, it does have the pop-ups. Great question. So yeah, and then you've got keyboard shortcuts there. So if I wanted to go in the detail brush, tap D. If I wanted to go into the contrast brush, t uh, tap T. So all those uh, little tips are enabled there. So here I'm using uh, the detail brush and we're going to come over El Capitan's face and, and I pumped up the amount because I really want the, that face to really snap here. So again using the perfect brush option, I'm just going to come in here and I'm not adding detail back into the clouds or the sky there. By using that perfect brush I'm really bringing out the detail. And again, I'll probably do that over on the right side. Bring out some of that, just like that. Now I'm going to come to our targeted brightness tool. So it's this eyedropper. Uh, and if uh, yeah, lights coming on and off here, OK, so um, all good. So the, the targeted brightness tool is a great way to selectively adjust a particular tone in the image. Uh, anybody know what the red filter did back in the day? Darkens, yeah. the, sky. Darkens the sky. You know, and it, if you don't know, just hover over. You know, we've got filter the, under the color response here. I could grab a red filter. It'll give you a little description of what those old traditional black and white filters did. But the targeted brightness tool is really cool. It allows me, if I click in the sky area, so I want to darken that sky, I'll click here, and if I drag to the left, I can immediately darken the tone just in effect of adding that red filter. How cool is that? And you notice we just affected the sky. One more touch on this image with the uh, selective editing tools. I'm going to come back with the brightness brush. And this time I'm going to burn down the foreground. So 
Everybody remembers the days of the burning and dodging and burning in the dark room, right? Yeah, exactly. So look how quick I can do this. So uh, I want to go to darken, and I'm going to put a nice feather on, on this. So get a nice soft feather there. So nice graduated and increase my brush size. I don't really need the perfect brush enabled on this one. So watch this. So now I'll just using that feather it just creates that nice gradual transition you know I'm not having to go in set any kind of funky points to go in there and try and adjust those here it's just a basic brush creating a nice you know river of light right through that valley making it look like another mountains behind us how long did that take us there's our postcard image here we're giving Ansel a run for his money Toners, we've got realistic toners, you know, so typically we'd be toning in the dark room, so grab a selenium toner, very toxic. Here I can come in, adjust the amount in the shadows and the whites. And selenium would, when, you were when it was used in the dark room, would create archivability and give you really deep, rich blacks and sort of add a, a reddish purplish tint. Well, I have I have so much control over the effect itself with those sliders that I never had in the traditional darkroom. You know, you tone, you bleach, you tone, you come out, you wait for your print to dry down, and then go, no, that doesn't look right. And how much time did that take? Now with a single click, you know, you can go from that. That might end up on the refrigerator at my house or my mom's house. Won't end up on my wall, but now that might turn it into a 40 by 60 using our perfect resize as a gallery wrap that's going to hang over the living room couch. This is perfect black and white. Let's come out and show you some other images in black and white. But that, you know, how quick did we do that? That's the goal of what we do here at On One Software is to simplify. So you don't need to be Photoshop guru. And you know, you can do black and white and conversions in Photoshop. You can do them in Lightroom. But to add that, that toner look, you know, the selective editing tools, how quick we did that, one click presets in no time. Right click on this image, jump right into perfect black and white. I'll grab a preset, edit a copy. This is uh, one of my recent acquires. Uh, this is a camera from uh, post war Eastern Bloc Germany. It's a primer reflex with this humongous Carl Zeiss lens on it. Uh, and I actually shot this in the studio. I have a phase one digital back and I shot this and I thought, you know, there's just something wrong about this. I thought, well, maybe I can give this image some new life. Let's jump into black and white and see what I can do. So I created a preset and uh, in my preset and my high contrast film look here, came in, single click, Hasselblad, high contrast, film edge burn in no time. How quick did we do that? You know. That's experiment, and I'll come back with another image here and show you how quick that is. But these are film looks then that I've created that are my style. Just a, a, a clean, you know, rounded edge, sort of old antique postcard look there with a vignette. A rough film edge, you know, medium format look there. If I wanted a 35, it doesn't, it's not quite the proportion, so to me it doesn't quite look right because 35 it shouldn't be quite square. but. Those are the kind of looks that you get, you know, and it's about combining and experimenting. Let's grab another image here and I'll show you sort of again how we get to that preset creation. This was the image that you probably all saw when you signed up for the event here today, uh, Violin. This was the starting image uh, and this image, uh, you know, to me, terribly lit image. Nothing fancy here and actually I have this, this is the camera that I use to shoot that. Uh, I'm a film, you know, left pocket, my film point and shoot, my right pocket, my iPhone. That's how I roll. Uh, it's convenient, it's easy, you know. But this is, this is what I get. This, was the, this ended the last shot on this, on a particular roll of film. I had, I've got a collection of violins hanging on my wall at home. Uh, and to end the roll, I just did a quick shot. Got it back from the lab, they scanned my film, and there was something that, you know, I love the form of the violin. Violin's beautiful, but that image, you know, that isn't anything. That's a throwaway image. And so I thought, well, I wonder if there's anything I can do in black and white. So I opened it in black and white, and, you know, this is the basic black and white conversion. That's nothing fancy. It's nothing 
great there. Well, what I did was I started, I thought, you know, let's go into black and white, let's go into the 19th century processes. You know, this is the stuff you're not gonna get in Lightroom in Photoshop, are these vintage looks here. And I'm a huge fan. This is the foundation of photography as we know it. You know, the digital era is six years, really, seven years where it's been massively adopted. It's still in its infancy. Here, we're looking at the history of the medium with presets that we've created, the Ambro type, single click, get these stylized looks. You know, I'm a huge fan of the old tin types, the daguerreotypes. So I started with a daguerreotype. Look at that. You go from that to that, and that's the one click, you know, you start with that can preset. Well, we all like to customize, you know, make it your own. So here, what I did was then I came over to the right side, and I told you all when we started, I'm a Photoshop hack. I don't know what I'm doing 90% of the time, but I know I move on gut instinct. And for the most part, that gets me through. I know how to move a slider. You all know how to move a slider, right? Brightness, so I push brightness, I push contrast. And all I did was I came over to the right side and started just pushing sliders, clicking on filters. You see how the tone changed there. I can come over here, adjust that. And I just pushed sliders around. And what I came up with, I saved in my old school category. And so I took that preset and became grungier, and this was one of those effects. More of a sepia tone look there, with a daguerreotype, tintype look, and I can now apply that same look to multiple images in no time. And if I want to adjust something here, maybe I want to add a different toner, create a cyanotype. We've got coffee toners, copper toners, blue toners, all sorts of cool toners in here. I can add vignette or a border. So maybe, uh, you know, here for this particular image, it's probably not realistic that I'd add a uh, Polaroid type edge. But if I want it, I can come in here. You know, that's what I love. I love the old Polaroid. That's gone way of the dinosaur. Single click there, that's a Type 55. And the Type 55 used to be a peel apart 4x5 film that would give you a print on one side. It was black and white film and would give you a negative then that you could print in the darkroom. Well, this edge right here, that border, that's the old Polaroid film edge. That's what you're not going to get in Photoshop or Lightroom. And now, with a single click, I, I can apply that style. And like I said, you know, this, this image was a throwaway image kind of to begin with, but it has a lot of emotional, sentimental value to me. And it was my grandfather's violin. He's been deceased now for 35 years almost. And I have fond memories of him uh, teaching me, trying to teach me how to play these instruments. I, I didn't get the musical talent in my family. Uh, but, you know, I got to thinking, I thought, you know, gosh, that's a throwaway image to anyone else. But to me, it has so much emotional resonance with me. And I thought, you know, I can now take this image, turn it in from, from that throwaway image into maybe this itself becomes the heirloom piece that gets passed through my family. You know, as photographers in the digital age, we do not print nearly enough of our images. I've seen years of people's lives disappear in a hard drive crash. A lost DVD that had somebody's wedding that they got for a photographer that they hired for cheap and they gave them a DVD. Now they can't find that DVD or it's scratched or whatever, you know. I'm not saying go out and print all your images, but print the ones that matter. I can go to a place like Bay Photo, for example, uh, on the West Coast, they print on metal substrates now. I can have and recreate the look of the old daguerreotype when my grandfather was born in the late 1800s, recreate that look, and maybe the violin doesn't stand the test of time, but this now becomes the piece that gets passed along through my family. Absolutely love, you know, and I couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't do that by myself in the dark room. There's people that can, you know, still doing that, but for the rest of us, it's inspired me to go back. I've got a collection of his old instruments to go back and reuse. Uh, and, and shoot these actually in a, in a decent manner rather than just a little quick point and shoot and come back and create a whole series uh, of these instruments. So that's perfect black and white. Uh, just absolutely love this product on what you can do, whether it's a portrait, whether it's a landscape, whether it's an object. You know, it's giving you those realistic looks there in no time. Click apply, returns me right back to Lightroom, stacked back with my original.
Any questions? Yeah. Can you make your own textures to put in there? In Not directly into perfect black and white, but you can into perfect layers. So you can do texture overlays. And when you're in perfect layers, when you're in the extras category, I'll come back and show that here in just a minute, you can get your own textures then to show up there. Let's jump into perfect portrait. So portrait retouching, we uh, have simplified the process. Any portrait photographers out there? Couple, okay. So this is probably the bane of every portrait photographer's life is, you know, the reality is, is if you're taking portraits, you're retouching them, it's just a question of how long do you want to spend doing it. I'd rather be taking pictures, not spending hours and hours of time retouching them. So here, right click, edit in, I'm gonna edit a copy here. Uh, this image was shot by one of our partners, a uh, great high-end uh, Photoshop retoucher out of Washington, D.C. Her name's uh, Christy Shirk. Uh, Shark Pixel is her company. Beautiful imagery and really does amazing work. Uh, this is one of her images. And so we've got auto face detection that we've developed. Uh, and that green border then has uh, detected the face and we've automatically applied a smoothing, a brightening, and a whitening just by opening the product. So I haven't done anything other than open the product. Let me zoom in here a little so you can see what's going on here. So there's, uh, here's the original. And you might be thinking, what are we doing any retouching for? She looks great to begin with. But the reality is, if you're shooting portraits for a living, you're retouching. So there's just the slight retouch. And you can see how we've just sort of brightened, whitened, softened just a bit. And now what I can do is I can start finding that sweet spot that I like. I'm going to start over here uh, on the skin retouching side, uh, on the right side here. We've got smoothing, we've got shine. The first thing that I kind of noticed are like the white specular highlights. Uh, I was just in Phoenix uh, a week ago actually with a, uh, one of the B&H crew that was out there. It was warm and people were glistening and it's a real tough thing to try and address when people are hot out, they get that shine. I walked over here, I was getting a little warm, uh, it was pretty nice out. Uh, so here you grab that shine slider, it's going to just neutralize those real bright areas, bring some skin tone in. You all know how to do that slider, right? You're not having to go in, we're not brushing anything in. We're looking for those really white specular areas there. Uh, and then what I can do is oh, even out the overall skin tone too. So the more I push up that shine, the more pinkish tones are going to get picked up there. That's a little heavy there, let's bring that back just a bit. But I can even that out with the evenness slider. This is going to even out the overall skin tone there, just like that. When we look at a portrait, you know, the first place our eyes go to are the subject's eyes. So I really want to make those eyes snap. So here, come down to the eyes and mouth tab. And this is where you're going to see the whitening in the detail slider here. So I'm going to give a little extra whitening to those eyes. And I'm just going to pump up the detail here just a bit. Right? Some people are like, wait, that's way too much. Uh, you know, and, that, and that's the thing. It's like I know a lot of photographers that go to extremes. They say they cli their clients want it. You know, I tend to want less. Like, okay, let's bring that back. Let's bring, I'm just using that as the example so you can see you can go to those extremes uh, to do so. Her teeth, they're pretty white to begin with. I don't think she needs... Uh, anymore. They're pretty nuclear bright there. Let's uh, tone those down. You know, but you can see we've automatically detected that and then I can just refine the brightening and the whitening. I'm not having to go in and do any advanced selecting. We've already done that for you. So the vibrant slider. Maybe I want just a little more reddish look on the lips there. If I click on the face here, these will show the points that we created in the auto face detection. <laughs> And you notice that those eyes aren't perfectly selected. Uh, but I tend to think we as photographers get overly aggressive in our retouching. We spend way too much time. We zoom in at 100%. We want to make sure everything's perfectly selected. I like to hide the controls and make those adjustments initially. How does it look to my eye without seeing any of those points? And I guarantee probably 99.9% .9 of you did not notice that those eyes weren't perfectly selected. But when you start looking at those things, you can, oh yeah, well if you like to have all those things perfectly selected, just come in here, you can make those adjustments, come in, you know, refine those effects, just like that, and make sure the effect is being applied entirely to the eye or the mouth here. 
So I can just come in here just like that. But again, I don't like to look at those. What I do see is a little smoothing spilling into the hair. And that's over here. I don't have to switch it to any tools. I'm already in this tool. Um, it's the knot scan brush here. So I'm just gonna paint right along the edge here. And that's gonna remove any smoothing that might sometimes spill into the hair. That will happen occasionally. We've got retouch brush here. So this is a, like the healing brush in Photoshop. And what I'm gonna do, this works great for nuking complexion flaws, acne, spots on the face. What I'm going to do here is use it to minimize the lines under the eyes. Rather than using it at full opacity, what I'm going to do is bring this down to about 60%, maybe 50. And I'm just going to go under the lines of the eyes here. I don't want them to totally go away. My client might want that, but I want to try and keep it looking somewhat realistic, right? So there we've minimized them a bit. There's the original. There's a quick retouch. And I can save this as a preset, so maybe I have examples of 10, 15 images that I'm gonna hand off to my client you know, from that same session. I can apply that same look then, get that same smoothing. Again, selective brushing would not carry in the preset, so any of that brushing that I'm doing under the eyes, I'd actually have to go in and do uh, for each of those eyes. But smoothing, brightening uh, of the eyes, that type of thing, that carries. Question in the back. Yeah, if you want to get like the center of the eye as absolutely sharp as possible, like I don't know if you've seen these posters for Game of Thrones, there are a lot of New York, they're all, all over, or even like Steve McCurry's photos, they're so deadly sharp. I was wondering how you would do that. And also, a little hair on her forehead, if you want to, to get rid of that, how much you do it? Yeah, so, the, so the, depending on how much hair on the forehead, sometimes the. Uh, that tool, the, the tool that I'm in here, uh, the retouch tool will sometimes work. Uh, it depends. Uh, what I probably do is zoom in. If there's a lot of hair, it doesn't always work, but I can sometimes go in, paint out hair uh, with um, the healing brush there. Uh, for the eyes, uh, to get the effect that you're kind of talking about, you probably need to go, let me open up another image here and show you with the detail slider here. Uh, I can make some crazy looking eyes. Um, how extreme you want to go, that's up to you, but uh, this image doesn't show it particularly well. I've got another image where the eyes, they're really blue and you really see the eyes go uh, extreme here. So let me open up that image and I'll show you. If I couldn't do it in perfect portrait, what I would do is probably go over to perfect effects and use uh, some of the like uh, detail brushes in there where you can paint detail to really accentuate the eyes, uh, colors, you can do different effects with that. Uh, but for here, for perfect portrait, let's open up this image because I can make these eyes go really extreme uh, with the detail in perfect portrait here. So these blue eyes will brighten those a bit, but then I'll push those eyes and this might be that kind of effect that you're looking for. And I think that's going to vary based on the subject itself. So, yeah, so here, so if I want crazy looking Game of Thrones, which I'm not totally familiar with. <laughs> right? Is that, <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind of crazy extreme. So, so, th so that's the detail. And, and you know, that's where you would do it, but they te it tends to really stand out when you have lighter eyes than you do darker. She had really dark eyes. So really trying to accentuate. I mean, you are gonna get a little kick in the eyes themselves, but pe people with lighter eyes, I can pretty much just do that in <laughs> portrait, right? So, yeah, so that's that's how I do that. Yeah, go ahead. Are there any uh, presets for portraits? Yeah, there are. Uh, we've got actually included, so let me open up. Actually, that's hiding. That's how it should look. So just like perfect effects, perfect black and white. So we've got great presets to begin with. So if I wanted a heavy retouch, elderly retouch, full body. So by default, when we open up a uh, perfect portrait, we are limiting the effect to the face, the smoothing all to the face. Some people want upper shoulders, neck, uh, or full body. What you'd want to do is uncheck this face only option and it would apply smoothing uh, to the entire skin range uh, in, in the image there. So uh, we do have great presets then that you can go in over here, start with those, start with a single click preset, then come over to the right side, 
make those adjustments to your liking. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, where face is only? Or? Uh, right, right here uh, under the skin oh, retouching. Okay. That little check box there. So if you uncheck that, and if I if I want to keep it like that, so maybe I just want to go in and add some smoothing down into the neck here. Let's go into actually click in the face here. I want to hide the controls. Those tend to bug me. Here we go. So if I want to add smoothing, so I'm already in the skin, not skin brush here. So I just tap X on the keyboard. And that toggles me to add skin, and you can see plus and minus in the brush there. So if I wanted to add smoothing to the neck, I can just paint that in as well. And if I want heavier smoothing, I can push smoothing in, or push the smoothing. I can see it's spilling a little in the hair, so I'll remove it from the hair there. So you can easily add without, you know, if you want to maybe apply it to the neck and the upper arm without applying it to the whole body, it's a full body shot. I'd keep the face only checked and then just go in and uh, add that manually. Uh, it comes up, you know, well, how does it work with multiple faces? You know, so here, right click again. This is a image with a bunch of people in it. So we've got, uh, what do we got here? Ten kids. So. It'll slow down a little because we're doing auto face detection at this point. And uh, it's going to slowly start picking off one of those bing, 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 bing. Those faces will start popping up. And you have the ability to go in and retouch each face independently. So here in just a second, it'll pop up. It'll have all those faces detected. And then I can go in and retouch each face independent of each other. You know. Maybe there'll, there'll be times too when uh, you fail to find a, a face. If we're, you're in a profile setting, we don't see two eyes, we're going to fail to find a face. So I'm going to delete her face. So what do you do if it does not find a face? There will be times when that happens. So here you come up to the face tab, go add face. And this will give me the bounding box then. And I'll just resize this. Position that right over her face there. Let's bring that in. I don't need all that. That looks pretty good. Click apply. So now it'll apply the default smoothing, brightening, whitening to that face. Maybe I just want to edit her. I can come in. It'll zoom into her face. Show me the points. And again, I don't like looking at those. Let's hide those. Let's look at the eyes, whitening. You can see how we're just brightening those up just a bit. Again, those teeth are pretty bright. You know, I have independent control over each face, maybe a little more vibrance on the lips there. I'm done. I, I zoom back out. You can see then I have the ability to go between each face independently. So you can click on each face or when I'm actually in this tab here, these little arrow keys will toggle. So the arrow keys are up here on the top. Up here. So yeah, just click on those arrow keys here. It didn't do a very good job at finding that eye, so I might need to go in, adjust that. Just like that. But that's how you would do it. You can go jump from face to face by clicking on those arrow keys. That's how you do it. So multiple faces, um, profiles, again, will fail to find. So you can go in, just manually add a face by going up through the face, add face. And if you want, maybe you don't, you know, an example. Let me show you another image here. Um, maybe I don't want uh, a face selected. So this was actually my family here that I did a quick retouch before we uh, started, so I thought, eh, I wonder, you know, see if I've got anything of my own here. What a nice so that is my family. That was Sunday uh, for Easter, and in this, and I'm using this as an example as something that it will find that shouldn't necessarily be found. I think. Oh, it didn't do it the first time it did it. 
Uh, it detected the Easter Bunny back on the couch there. So, <laughs> turn sideways there. Yeah. So, so now here I have the ability again to to go through and, and retouch each face independently of each other. Um, Uh, profile, no, it does not. So you will want to turn eyes off. So you can turn that off while you only apply a smoothing. So it doesn't. Great question, though. So that's perfect portrait. You know, auto face detection. I could go in, I could spend a while retouching. I think I spent 10 minutes. I th actually think I did this. One of these I retouched here. Let's see if I can find. Uh, let's see, oh, that's the original. This should be the edit. I'll open this in Photoshop because I did do a retouch here. I wasn't gonna spend all morning or all afternoon uh, showing you all this, but so there's the original and then this was the little retouch that I did. You can see just toning him down a little and it, you know, it does, you know, at the end of the day, it's also to think about like how heavy you're gonna retouch to what it's gonna be used for. At the end of the day, this is gonna be a four by six that ends up on my mom's mantle or, or five by seven, you know, that's the reality. So I'll tend to maybe go just a little heavier to bring out a little more of the eyes because you're just viewing it at, at a smaller uh, level there. So, but that's how quick it is to go in, quickly do a retouch. So that is perfect portrait. We carry on. Let's jump into perfect, uh, what do we got perfect left here? Perfect resize, right? I mean, yeah, let's open up this image back into perfect resize. So this would be a great example. Uh, edit. I'm going to edit a copy here. So here we right click. It's going to open that image back up. So here's my perfect effects that I started with. Maybe I want to create a gallery wrap from that. Uh, so again, much, very, I should say very similar uh, user interface now across multiple plugins. Uh, these, you know, didn't always used to be the same. There was a lot of differences between plugins. We really tried to streamline everything to make it easier, more familiar as you go from plugin to plugin. Not all of them are exactly the same. We're working towards getting them all much more uh, alike, but uh, uh, four or five of the plugins now are uh, very similar. And just like Perfect Effects, Perfect Black and White, Perfect resize here. Down the left, the, you're going to find your presets. So these are uh, new to this version. Uh, coming from any previous version, we're all, you know, again, that one click preset. So now if I want to go to uh, a particular, I've got resin coated paper. So if I'm uh, printing with a uh, premium gloss or a glossy, I'm going to use the resin coated. Uh, my buddy has the 9900 printer. Uh, he prints canvases for me, so I'll get uh, 40 by 60 canvases created here. Well now, rather than me having to go in and make those adjustments, I can do a single click 40 by 60 gallery wrap here in no time. And it's automatically created the wrap. This one has a film edge on it, so maybe I'd remove the film edge before I went in and did this. But maybe it's a 3 inch wrap. You know, uh, this would take me half hour to create by hand in Photoshop, at least that wrap, that extended border when you're printing uh, on canvas and you're uh, going over the stretcher bar there, single click. This is what I love about Resize now is that it's so streamlined. It's doing sort of the laborious tasks for me. And we're known for that genuine fractals algorithm, those mural size prints that you see everywhere. Chances are they were done using our product. We've been the industry standard for a decade. Uh, we actually acquired this plugin from another company. It's been the industry standard. Uh, for a very long time and now we give you beyond that genuine fractals algorithm all these great little tools that, that simplify when you're printing. You know I had the original Epson photo printer in uh, the late 90s and I wanted to experiment um, with large format printing. You know wide format did not exist at that time. Uh, it was a few years later but I had the original Epson photo printer and when I was in the studio I wanted to take my images and print 40 by 60s. So I would tile them in Photoshop. Well I'd choke my machine because the images were so large and memory, you know, uh, we had 8 megabytes of RAM, 16 megabytes of RAM, it was ridiculous. Um, but I would tile and it would seriously take me all day in Photoshop to do tiling. With a single click here I can go in, turn tiling on. This is letting me know that it won't give the preview of the wrap there. 
But now if I wanted to tile this image, and maybe I want to do 10 inch tiles, one click. And what's cool about this is I can go in and say, you know, maybe do a triptych or a diptych, whatever that is, single click, you know, and that would typically take me some time in Photoshop to segment out those. Here, one click, I've created 10 inch tiles. And what's even cooler is that I can print on canvas uh, with gallery wraps. This is automatically going to create a gallery wrap for each of those tiles. That would have taken me two days in Photoshop to do. That, it's those little things. And then I can come over here, I can turn sharpening on or turn it off. You know, you can kind of see what's happening. You get a little, that's a, a bit much. And so I tend to, when I'm doing my resizing, I tend to bring sharpening down uh, just a bit there. But we've got film grain, so you can add film grain, tiling. If I wanted, uh, so if I turn to tiling back off here, it shows me the gallery wrap. If I wanted a little darker gallery wrap there, I can adjust that. I actually can change. So I can go to a Reflect Soft, where it just softens it. I can go to Stretch. So depending on what the um, image is, there's going to be dif different methods that I'm going to want to use uh, at various times. Uh, when you're using the Stretch method, it, it looks into the image about a half inch and then sort of stretches out that. Uh, so sometimes that works great. If it's a really busy image, that doesn't always work great. So I'll typically use the Reflect method. Let's go into perfect mask here. So I'm going to right click on and uh, actually I forget myself. Got to go through the plugin extras when you're working with perfect mask. Plugin extras is how you get to perfect layers and how you get to perfect mask here. And so somebody was asking a little earlier about uh, adding your own textures. You can add your own textures, you can add your own backgrounds. Uh, that will only show up in layers uh, here in the extras category. So here, if uh, being that we were talking about textures, if I wanted a texture or add my own, I can add it to this category here. So I could say add a ground glass texture here before we jump into mask. I just wanted to show you this. Change my blending mode here. And you can get, so I've got different blending mode changes then. So if I wanted to do a variety of different texture overlays, We've got a lot more different uh, blending modes now. But so if I wanted some texture, that's how you do it. You can add it to the extras category. Uh, we've got a great uh, knowledge base article. So if you've got like, common questions, go to our website. Uh, go to the support page. Uh, this is where you're going to find how to import backgrounds, how to import textures. You know, the, the, the mask that we'll do on another image here, people ask, you know, hey, I've got 1,000 of my own skies. I don't want to use your skies. Can I easily get them to show up? Yes, you can. Uh, and they will show up. You can create your own category here, add it to the backgrounds category all uh, very easily here. So let's delete that texture here. So uh, here we're going to just click on mask. And we're going to do some background removal here. We give you some great tools that simplify uh, the whole process. Uh, making it much more easy uh, to remove backgrounds. I'm going to delete these. I had these originally set here, so these were my keep and drop colors. But with a new version of our Perfect Mask, we have uh, some new tools. Uh, if you're familiar with some of our earlier product, uh, one called uh, Mask Pro, uh, you, you go in, you use keep drop colors, use the magic brush uh, to paint away. We now have some new tools, Auto Drop Brush. So what I can do here is, just the second tool down here, come right through here, paint, and it's going to remove a good chunk of that sky really quickly. And then what I do is, is I'll come back through here. So depending on uh, the subject and what I'm removing, sometimes it's easier for me to just go grab the normal brush, remove anything that might be down here, like so. Actually, I'm not doing that very well. But we've got different tools then. So right here in the hair, this is where, after using that auto drop brush here, I'm going to use uh, this refine brush. So this third tool down. And this is where it's going to clean up the, the hair here. So just like this, I'll come right through that hair. And this sometimes might take a couple strokes to, to go through 
and clean up those edges just a bit. And so the, the other thing too is that there's no one perfect tool for every situation. Uh, masking, you know, that some tools work better than others. Magic, it's using a combination of tools uh, at various points during the process. So uh, in the past, our magic brush here, so I've gone to a different tool here. And in the past, you would go in and set very specific keep and drop colors. There's gonna be times when you wa wanna continue to do that. Here, if I click, little secret about the magic brush is that whatever you uh, click on directly below the brush tip are the colors that it'll sample to remove. So here, I click right there and I'm just gonna start painting through that hair there. Just like that. How cool is that? Pretty cool. So I'll come back in here, clean that up. Chisel tool, uh, let's start with the pin tool here. So strong edges, you know, we can trace, trace an edge there. You know, in Photoshop, you remember, oh, how do you go backwards? Yeah, you couldn't really. With ours, you can retrace your steps there. Magnetic, and I can control, you know, set the, mag, uh, the attraction strength. So if I want less or more, just like this, but I can come down, set a point, come over here, and then close that path. And when you hover into the center, you see how that turns to a little uh, gavel. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's just a little gavel. I click that, it'll remove that area. So uh, that's a great tool for large continuous uh, tone, like a house, sometimes that works really good, uh, depending on how complex the sky is. Uh, for cleaning up the hair here, what I do is use the chisel tool, and the chisel tool, uh, let's set up the amount just a bit here, it's a great tool for cleaning up edges, and here I can just paint through that hair and it's just going to remove some of that fringe right through there, just like that, in no time. So depending on what the subject is, there's a variety of tools, let's grab another image here, and I'll show you. Uh, some of those tools in action as well. So let's jump back into Lightroom here. Do a sky swap here. Plug in extras, jump back into uh, create. I don't want to save. So here we've got uh, a veil that we're gonna remove the sky from and a new sky. And this is where you know, it comes up, hey, I've got my own skies. You, know, you can get them imported into the backgrounds category here. What I did was I grabbed an existing sky that we have. So we've got all these great skies that we've included. But if you've got your own content, you can easily get that in here. And I just double clicked on this guy, adds as a layer over here uh, in the layers. And what I wanna make sure is that it's directly below the image then that I'm removing the sky from, or removing the background from, I should say. So uh, there it is, directly below. Now we launch into Mask. So this is one of the frustrating things some users will experience uh, using the auto brushes set at their default. So if I just click Remove Background, it's going to remove a huge chunk. The veil's gone. It didn't do a very good job. So uh, that, that's something that we get, you know, people say, hey, it doesn't quite work the way you do it. Well, there's some things we need to do first. And something to be aware of is when you're using the auto drop brush, if too much gets removed in the initial drop, bring the segment size down. If not enough gets removed, push the segment slider up. So these settings up here, this is the auto drop brush. I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna bring down these default settings to about two. So right about there. And now when I click Remove Background, it's gonna remove 90% while protecting that veil. So those are the little tips to be aware of when you're using those auto drop tools. And then there's an area back here that didn't get removed. I'll click once, remove that. Now I'm gonna to switch tools. Now the tough part, what would traditionally be the tough part, uh, is that veil. So now I'm gonna grab that magic brush again and I'm gonna click on the edge of the veil here and I'm just gonna start painting through the veil. I hear an ooh, all right? How cool is that? Try doing that in Photoshop. You know, that, that's, a, that's a really a tough thing there. So we've just removed the old sky there. Let me zoom in here a little. And 
you know, the, the, the dead giveaway with any mask, this one it isn't particularly bad, but you know, how many times have you seen people shot on a white backdrop, they've been cut out and they've got this halo around them, or they were shot on a green screen and they've got, you know, they're glowing nuclear green. I can't tell you how many times through the years I've seen this, you know, and it's just, it's poor masking and, you know, so again, how do you effectively deal with that? Well, we give you some great cleanup tools and that chisel tool again, uh, this tool right here, this works great for trimming the fringe. So uh, I have it set kind of high. If you look along the edge here, you can see I'm just trimming just that edge. So I can run that along an edge where that fringe remains. If you look up here towards the top of the veil here, if I double click on the chisel tool, it'll trim the fringe around the entire image. So very quick and I can control the amount. So if I need, if I wanted to see a huge chunk removed, there it went. How cool is that? Wow. I'm done. I click apply. It's going to return me right back to layers. If I was using Photoshop, I could load uh, the mask as a selection. I could use, you know, Photoshop's refine tools if I wanted. At the end of the day, I just maybe want to reposition the sky here. So I'm going to grab this sky reposition that, you know, maybe I want more cloud there, you know, that's how cool it is. And, and how long did it take me? You know, we're in, we're out. We're not spending all day doing this. I've got one more to show you here. Here's a Matt's demos. Say again? Matt's demos. Matt's demos? Yes. I don't have any of Matt's demos. Uh, Matt Kliskowski? Yes. Yeah, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any of Matt's with me. Uh, I have uh, some of his perfect effects. But here, we're going to jump right into focal point. We're going to end with focal point. We're getting on that magic hour here. So thanks for uh, sticking through two hours. I know two hours can be a little long. See a few people like, oh, it's dark in here and nappy. And I hear you. So uh, this is focal point. This has uh, been my favorite uh, plugin, though. Um, Black and White's giving a run for its money. But what I love about Focal Point, this is actually the Markham Bridge in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Dan Harlicker shot this. Uh, pretty cool, huh? So uh, I open this in Focal Point. This is what it's going to look like. Actually, it's going to look more like this when you open it. And this is the focus bug. This works great on a portrait. Uh, if you want to like soften up the face, grab that round bug, position that. Uh, over the face. For this image, we're going to use the masking bug, or not the masking bug, but we're going to change the shape so it's like the masking bug to the planar bug here. So I'm going to grab that planar right here, and that is like the masking bug we were using, only this time we're using it to apply depth of field and get that nice creamy bokeh. So here I'm adjusting the size, and I'm going to position this right over the center of the bridge here, just like that. Uh, we actually have some lens presets here I'll show you here. So uh, here I come in, we're going to give you a more realistic looking uh, bokeh than what you're going to get out of Photoshop. Great question. Uh, so that doesn't look particularly realistic to me. Th that's not what I expect shooting with a high-end piece of glass, you know. Um, it's a nice starting point, but it's not very fancy. Pay attention here because this is your really expensive lens bag, your $30,000 in lenses that don't weigh 150 pounds. <laughs> there they are. So I can go in and grab a lens preset. You know, I love the Canon 85-1.2. Single click, and now I'm starting to get the bokeh that I'd get shooting with that particular lens. So I go from that to that, and then what's even cooler is I can come in and refine this again. So maybe I want to just bring it down just a bit. I can just tweak it with the amount slider here. Uh, if I push the optical quality, I can get sort of the donut-centric look there uh, in the highlights back there. So I can really come in and refine this. As we add that blur, uh, our specular highlights dim down. The, the city lights back there, they lose their twinkle. Come over here to the highlight bloom slider, and I can bring some of that back. Optical quality, you know, again, I can adjust that. The curvature, let's push the curvature all the way out. Let's find that sweet spot. Um, I like it right about there. And I tend to go a little brighter with the highlight bloom slider uh, to really bring those highlights up because then what I do is I come back and I use vignette to darken up the edges. So I'll come down here to the vignette 
and really sort of draw your attention in. And I want to not follow the focus bug, so I uncheck that right there. And just really sort of draw your attention in towards the center of frame. So you see how it dims down a little. Everybody know how to use a tilt shift lens? Yeah, yeah right? Or a view camera, right? Yeah, it's a, some people do. Some people know how to use it. I have that Ansel Adams 8x10 size camera. Uh, the days of me sitting under that, you know, swinging the front elements, trying to get that beautiful out of focus, you know, they're pretty much gone. Uh, here, whether you know how to use them or not, you all know how to click and drag again. Click in the center of the bug, hold down the option key, the alt key on the PC, and I can throw the plane of perspective. And if I want to throw focus to the left, to the right, more focus in the foreground. I can easily achieve that by doing that. How cool is that? We go from that to that, and what I love about it is that, you know, the reality I said I roll around with a point and shoot and an iPhone. I can now take my iPhone imagery, bring it into focal point, make it look like it was shot with a $2,000 lens. Maybe some of you are just getting started in photography. You only have a basic DSLR camera that has that 5.6 lens that doesn't have that super fast with focal point, you can achieve the look in no time. So that is the overview uh, of our perfect photo suite seven here. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining me. If you're still awake in the back there, uh, thanks for uh, coming out. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.